you know what? You guys have been supporting us so much. So, I'm giving away two PlayStation Slims. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. This right here is PlayStation's newest console, the PlayStation 5 Slim. From a digital PlayStation 5 parked in my living room, I bought one of these to see what the hype is all about. I wanted to unbox it, take a look at its new features, its new form factors, set this up with you guys and review it. So if you are thinking of getting one or you are thinking of either replacing your PS5 1100 series or 1200 series, here's what you should know about the latest PlayStation 5 Slim. Let me know what you guys think about the Slim down below. Coming from the digital version, I decided to get the disc version. I paid 650 Canadian dollars for it, getting me the Mother Warfare 3 bundle. In terms of packaging, you guys will notice we no longer get a handle on these. Now opening this up, the very first item you'll get to see is the power cord. Still the same old C7 connector we got with last gens. The only thing that differs here is these oddly looking transparent feet. The rest is still the same old with the same USB-C charging cable, an HDMI 2.1 cable, the same standard DualSense controller in this foam packaging, and of course, a manual with the digital game code along with a proper guide on how to operate and install numerous things. As for the rest, the PlayStation 5 Slim. I do wish Sony had included the disc or digital version in their bundles according to the specific PS5 version you got. That would have been cool. The very first thing you'll notice when you get a Slim is that weight wise it kind of feels very similar to the original PS5. I mean it does make sense since the internals are practically the same. I guess the only noticeable difference when it comes to it is that we get an extra USB-C module in front. Of course, it is smaller and slimmer, that I will say, compared to my Xbox Series S, I mean, this still feels huge, but compared to my old console, it's definitely noticeable. There's also the fact that I personally like this design much better, the fact that we get the eject button on the actual drive bay is nice, it also feels a lot more customizable this time around. I'm sure Sony will make really awesome custom covers for this, so I'm guessing people will start mix and matching different types of panels, with a body encompassing a total of 4 panels, which by the way, are way easier to take off this time around. Turns out one of these does hide a new feature Sony implemented with the Slim, a removable disk drive. Super easy to uninstall and the fun part is that well, you can get a digital edition disk drive panel and install it here. So you do have that option if you ever need to cut weight while you are, I don't know, traveling. I'm sure you've noticed by now, but the top panels are glossy and the bottoms are matte. I love the fact they also kept the same design language with these. One of those glossy panels is responsible for encasing the SSD expansion slot. Again, super easy to install. Just as easy as it is to install these feet that allow you to rock the console horizontally. These just pop right in there and support the PlayStation along with the bulge of the disk drive. The only odd part about this is that with the digital version, your PS5 could wobble if you apply force to it. So if you have a cat going around, I would be careful. Now, when I got this, the very first thing I wanted to do was to transfer my NVMe storage to this. Funny thing, what I did was that I copied all my games and data to the NVMe. I wanted to see what would happen when I would plug this into the new console. So I took my original PlayStation 5 apart, uninstalled the SSD and transferred it into this one. When I turned it on, it rebuilt the database but nothing was there, so what I ended up doing was that I transferred everything into the new PS5's local storage and after 25 minutes, literally all my games were there ready to play. So that was cool. I think I should also mention that even though its internal storage is marketed at 1TB, you only get a whopping 848GB of usable storage. However, with one of the most recent updates, you can get up to 
almost nine terabytes if you install an eight terabyte NVMe SSD. I don't know who has a thousand dollars to spend on that, but it's there for you if you need it. Okay, so before upgrading your storage, I do recommend you go through this setup. That's actually the very first thing I did as soon as I unboxed this. I went through the basic setup. I updated the console, the controller's firmware, which is very important. Once all of those steps are done, I like to turn off data collection, which is a setting you will find within the users and accounts privacy menu. I always make sure to check my audio screen and video output so my resolution is hard coded to 4K, my VRR is on no matter what, and 120Hz is set to auto. Plus, with one of the most recent updates, I like to set my audio output format to Dolby Atmos. Now to quickly jump into the top bar menu, you can hit triangle and quickly head into the settings. In here, like we saw, you can of course change a lot of the system preferences, but the one I usually like to change is the default settings for games. By heading into save data and game app settings, you can choose to start new games on your preferred settings like either setting a default difficulty you like to go by or choosing to always prioritize something like performance instead of resolution. Within the same menu, by heading to save data, if you do happen to be a PS Plus user, I do recommend you have cloud storage enabled to auto sync your saved data. So if you ever were to change consoles or use a second console, you'd be sure to always have your progress with you no matter what. There's also a way to have a second controller connected to the same account. All you need to do is head to accessibility, controller, use second controller for assistance and toggle it on. This type of stuff is very useful when it comes to playing with kids or maybe a friend you'd like to help out. Also, one thing that does drive me crazy that we can finally turn off is the sound the console makes when turning it on or off. If you head to the settings, system and beep sound, you can either adjust the beep sound volume or you can completely mute it. You can also completely mute your TV from your controller. If you didn't know, a three second hold on your controller's mute button will do that. I also suggest your mic is muted by default every time you turn on your PlayStation. I think this makes privacy even better in case you forget to mute your mic. With that being said, you can log into your PS5 directly by showing yourself offline. Just press on your options button when you are about to log in and it'll do the trick. If you press the PlayStation icon on your controller, then down and you press the options key, you can rearrange your icons. I'm starting to think that having the power button along the accessories option at the start is the most useful. In the accessories option, you can either turn off your PS5 controller or if you want, you can also simply turn off your controller by pressing down the home button for 10 seconds. If you do decide to turn off the console instead, you can access save mode by holding the power button off the console for about 7 seconds. Plug the controller via USB and you can do things such as clear the cache of your PlayStation 5 or rebuild its database. My favorite tip and trick though is properly setting up my controller for better battery life. If you head to settings, accessories and controller, I recommend you turn down the brightness of the controller's indicators. Further down, you can also turn down the speaker volume, which I also suggest doing. In system, power saving, and within the set time until controller turns off, you can set the PS5 controller to turn off after 10 minutes of not using it. Within the same menu, in features available in rest mode, you can also make sure the console supplies power to the USB ports while in rest mode. I think with this, you should have a solid setup for your console, regardless of whether or not you decided to get a digital version or a disc version. But look, if you are currently struggling with that decision, I honestly think you no longer need to spend time overthinking it. The fact that you can now easily upgrade your digital version to become a disc version is pretty cool. After all, I think at its core, the new PS5 Slims are digital versions. One ships with a hard disc bay that you can still buy separately and the other one doesn't. Everything else that comes after that is the exact same. A lot of people still say that digital is the way to go. However, I've been thinking about it and if for some reason something happens to your internet, you accidentally get your PS5 account hacked or you completely forget your password, 
all of the games you purchase digitally on that account will be gone. I think these are small little details that you might want to consider, which is why on my end I'm starting to lean a bit more towards discs. As of now, all the games on my home menu really all depend on my account. If I lose that, that's about $500 to $600 worth of games lost. To round this up, let's talk about thermals and noise because it's interesting. As someone that does store their PlayStation 5 in a confined space, thankfully thermals for me has never been an issue on my original PlayStation 5. I do think the fact that by rocking a 6 nanometer chip that runs cooler on the newer OG units compared to my original 7 nanometer chip that they released at launch can definitely help some more. So in this confined space I honestly feel just as confident docking the PlayStation 5 Slim horizontally without having to worry about heat dissipation. I was recently told to never stand the PlayStation 5 upright. Rumor was that the liquid metal could affect thermals and performance because it would heat up and drip down if upright. I saw a few TikTok videos regarding this issue so I decided to take my old unit apart. On my unit, I did find that my liquid metal was sort of starting to pull up on one side. However, for the past 3 years I've had this, I never found my performance to degrade over time or my console to get any hotter. Anyways, regardless, I think rocking the new unit horizontally would also be saving you around 40 Canadian dollars because of this stand. Considering the fact that we have the 1200 series PlayStation 5 practically injected into this body with a reduced volume by more than 30% and weight by 18%, I wonder how will it handle heat in the long term? With this reduced size, a reduced heat sink with the same materials that also uses a different spec fan compared to my 1100 series, my main question is how will this affect things like CPU temperatures, SSD temperatures if any, GPU temps and so on. On my end, for the little time I've had this, after putting some hours on Modern Warfare 3, it doesn't seem to get any hotter than my old PlayStation 5 did, nor does the power output differ that much in any way with the same 370 watt power supply this has. Whether it was on idle, in home screen or in game, the numbers between both don't fluctuate much, but what about the noise? Well. Actually, I guess with this denser model and this smaller Foxconn 19 blade fan, I figured it would need to work at a faster rate to cool the system more effectively, so the PlayStation 5 Slim's fan would probably need to be running slightly louder. I'm not quite sure if that's the case on my end, however, it seems to be hiding the coil noise from this console. I'm comparing this to my original digital PlayStation 5 version where the coil whine is far more noticeable without the fan running so loud. As a casual gamer, this could be annoying depending on how close your PlayStation 5 sits on your setup. In my living room, for example, because I'm sitting far from the TV, it really isn't a big deal. You know what, maybe you'd want to hear this for yourself. Look, I can totally see how it would be an issue for those who rock this on their gaming setups. On my end, for a living room, it's more than just fine. And so look, if you are struggling with your decision, it's important to know something. The new PS5 Slim is very much identical to last year's 1200 series PlayStation 5. If you come from an 1100 series like I do, I mean, I don't know, maybe you'd like to consider this? At the end of the day, there are different designs in terms of components such as the memory modules. Yes, the motherboard is different, it's smaller, contains a smaller heatsink, there is an improvement in the internal SSD design, like one having a 4 chip design instead of the original 6 chip design. Another improvement is the build quality of the power supply which can also play a role as to why coil wine is not as noticeable. However, at the end of the day, when you take a look at the bigger picture, in practice, it very much feels the same so there's no need to feel penalized for buying an OG console. Some people will appreciate the additional USB-C port on the front, others will disapprove of the fact they removed the fin design. Maybe just save your money and wait for the PlayStation 5 Pro. 
Aside from noise and thermals, I feel like all the testings going on online shouldn't be the reason as to why you should upgrade your system unless you're someone like me with an older digital console that wants to move back to the disc world, then it would make sense. If you currently are not a PlayStation 5 owner, I would suggest finding yourself an OG 1200 series PS5 at a good price. If you are currently an owner, aside from what I mentioned, I don't think the slim is worth the upgrade. If I missed anything that was worth mentioning, please let me know down below. I'm curious to know what you think about this new release. I'm honestly just waiting for GTA 6 to come out. I love to get a disc copy to keep. I can't wait. Hope you liked this video and it served you well. I'm signing out once more. Till next week, take care.